Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. My name is Tamara Edwards, and on behalf of the Arthur Lockjack Global School of Business, I would like to welcome you to today's webinar. We are pleased to be hosting this event today on business continuity and the role of insurance in it. We have experienced and knowledgeable presenters today who will be sharing their insights and expertise. A couple of housekeeping notes before we begin. Please do not turn on your mics during the presentation. This is to avoid any feedback. We welcome your interaction and invite you to ask your questions via the Q&A chat box at the bottom of your screen. You may do so at any time throughout the webinar. However, we will address all questions after all of the speakers have made their presentations. Since we have only a short time together, I will introduce all of our speakers now. So let's meet your speakers. Mr. God Vincent, consultant trainer and principal consultant at Business Crisis Consultants. He has 27 years experience in emergency response, crisis management and incident command systems. His past experiences include being contracted as the Chief of Emergency Operations at BP Trinidad, an emergency respond consult response consultant and manager for Hummingbird Group Trinidad, providing training for Atlantic, Shell Trinidad, Metanex, Rep Repsol, NGC, New Iron, and the list goes on. At business crisis consultants, company clients, include uh, organizations in countries such as Trinidad and Tobago, Belize, Suriname, Guyana, and Antigua. Mr. Vincent holds an MSc in Occupational Health, Safety, and Environment, an MSc in cri Risk, Crisis, and Disaster Management, and he is also accredited as a trainer and auditor in the ISO Standards Business Continuity senior lead risk manager, as well as the OHSMS and security standards. So he is very qualified. He is a part-time lecturer and trainer at the Atalog Jack Global School of Business, the Energy Chamber Learning Center, both of which are in Trinidad, as well as a part-time lecturer at the Nation's School of Business in Guyana. So welcome, Mr. Vincent. Thank you for being here. Rhea Manki Sukram. Mrs. Sukram is an attorney at law called to the bar in Trinidad and Tobago and in Guyana. She is a certified mediator, vice chairman of the Trinidad and Tobago chapter of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators and a member of the Society of Trust and Estate Pr Practitioners. Rhea is also a family business advisor at Manki Sukram and Company and practices law and alternative dispute resolution. Rhea enjoys working with family enterprises and helping them to create their legacy for multi-generational continuity, wealth, and harmony. She has presented seminars and gives private family sessions on family business issues, such as succession planning, family governance, and communication and conflict management, providing actionable advice and guidance for the family business community. Thank you for being here, Ria. And finally, we have Mr. David Blank, who is the Managing Director at, of Altruism Financial Services Limited, which offers all lines of life and general insurance, as well as investment and financing under their Guardian Asset Management portfolio as an agent attached to the Calvin Mendez branch. David has nine years within the industry, insurance industry. During this time, his focus has been on business insurance solutions within the SME market for family and privately owned businesses. This service he also offers within the Eastern Caribbean market. Thank you for being here, David. So now that we know a bit more about our speakers today, I'm going to hand the floor over to them. First up is Mr. God Vincent. All right, thank you, Tamara. Um, good, well, what says good morning or good afternoon? Good lunchtime. <laughs> Happy lunchtime to everyone. Uh, thanks again for being here. And of course, good day to my other two distinguished speakers who will be 
following on the on the presentation. So let's dive right into it. So what we're going to look at today is, of course, looking at that whole business continuity uh, focus and where does the insurance uh, industry works within that. So get definition wise, we know business continuity is an organization's ability to ensure operations and core business functions are not severely impacted by disaster or unplanned incidents that may, that take, sorry, critical systems and processes offline leading to human loss, financial losses, and the worst case of all is permanent closure of your business. Good? So as we could see from that, you know that those are some of the challenges that you would have. A few of the greater things we wanna look at in this, we're gonna look at terminologies, we're gonna look at advantages of having your BC, BCP, which is short for business continuity plan or planning, testimonials from companies that have established BCP, which is always important to learn from them, and the benefits of being insured and the role it can play in your BCP strategy. Next. Good. So I want us in terms of our icebreaker this morning, I want us today, I want us to focus on something important, that question, that burning question. We have two burning questions here, but one of the main ones, uh, you know, looking in reflection or in hindsight, we're saying, if I only had a business continuity plan. So if we look back, we cast our mind back to like 15 months ago and imagine someone telling you that these things will be happening, public gatherings, more or less canceled, right? Hundreds of millions of people around the world out of work, millions of businesses insolvent and, and you don't need a global uh, news to tell you that. You could just walk around some of the areas we have here and you would see that for yourself. Governments throwing together some of the largest economic stimulus packages in history and major debt to GDP ratios, which exist right now, even in our own country. I know that UK, theirs was almost 100%. And I mean, there's a long, long growing list of that being present. Banks repossessing property for non-payment, good. And we know in terms of with a business focus, especially the smaller and medium-sized businesses, this is, is, is a horror story by itself. I, I like this one, I, I, I choose to keep it in. I, I, I don't really know if it's happening in Trinidad though. The homeless and socially displaced allowed to stay in hotels. I guess that might just be for a few weeks. Good, free of charge, you know, living the best life. Vaccines here, but uncertainty if they can withstand all variants. So I'm not saying that we're not supposed to take the vaccine. I'm a, I'm a big advocate of it. In fact, I just came this morning from my second shot. Good, but it's here. We don't know what, what the situation is and definitely we, we have to be prepared. It's all about preparedness. And then we have crime on the verge of skyrocketing. And it's, and it's been seen all around the world. If you look at, at the USA right now, crime is up like something 166% in sub, some states. And that's their return to normalcy. Good, it's something that we have to grapple with. So the other burning question I want you to focus on, and I put that in, 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 a, in a deadly reading there, how ready, was your business for this pandemic. Good, and that's something we have here in a poll. So the poll is up on the screen right now. I'm gonna allow you at least for 15 seconds to click yes, no, or somewhat ready. And we are eager to see what your response would be. Right, five seconds again. Right, okay. Tamara, do we have the results? Right, so we'll look at what we have here, how ready, and, 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 and again, we look at that, that we, we, we have, of course, some people being very brutally honest, all right, in saying no, 40% of our participants here say no, they, will, they weren't ready. And I love that, I, I like to focus on the somewhat ready because we all have what you call existing controls that we have in place. It may not actually be formalized, it may not actually be structured, but it can help to some degree of your, of your, of your resilience. And of course, congratulations to the 7% that stated that they, they, they were looking out for it. And I, I, I doing a lot of uh, um, risk assessment for some businesses, especially those that looking to do BCPs, um, I will tell you it's only like about one business I came across that I actually saw they had in their risk assessment a pandemic. I never even saw that anywhere else. 
they alone had a pandemic. They had an assessment for pandemic. So kudos to that company for having that. All right, so you could close the poll screen there. Okay, folks. So moving on next. All right, so some of the things that we need to look at when we have a business disruptions, all right, is things such as, well, you know, we are prone to the earthquake. All the, the studies have stated that we are due to receive that so-called big one, somewhere nine on the Richter scale. So if you like me, knock on wood right now, hoping that that doesn't happen, all right? You have fires, which could affect any business. Hazmat releases, some of you are next to companies that produce flammable or toxic products, good? And, you, you, and, and that's an important point too. Don't only just look at the risk assessment of your little bubble, right? What about those places adjacent to you? What about their operation? How does that threaten your business? Good. So that's something you always have to take into your whole assessment of your risk. Plant disruption, depending on what sort of business you're in. Flash floodings, and we know we have floodings. We are in the height of the rainy season right now. So floodings is really something that, and, and, and let's don't be, you know, let's don't be in that whole, what's the word, reactive phase whereby you're saying, oh, every year we get flooding. But yes, what are you doing? What are you doing to manage the flooding? So you have to put that into introspect. Terrorism, armed intruder shootings. Um, as you know, um, when the US read their advisory to the country, what's the first thing they say? We, we are known as a terrorist country, imagine that. So we're on the list and they would not make that up. So we do have certain cells that are present and doing these kind of things. So you have to be prepared. You must look at this. Don't, don't put that out of your, of your remit in your scope to look at. Financial risk to the business, cyber attacks right? Uh, radiation emergencies, depending on where you are located again and what your neighbor is doing. And of course, at the bottom, we have the, 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 the present star of the show at this point, pandemics, right? An epidemic threat. How are we prepared for that? Next slide. So before we, 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 we delve into some under, further understanding of it, we must get certain terminologies out of the way. So we already talked about a little bit about the business continuity and that's the capability to continue, right? Capability to continue delivery of your products or services at what we call acceptable predefined levels. Good, and I will talk about the advantages for having that in a little bit. Then there's that term you always hear BCP professionals use, which is organizational resilience. And that's the ability of the organization to anticipate, prepare for, respond and adapt to this changing environment after a sudden disruption. So I just showed you the pyramid that could create changing environments there. So you have to be prepared for those things. Good. And I just had to put that little note there to let you know that pandemics themselves usually last for about two years or more before some level of normalcy would return. You would, you would hear the airport industry tell you that, that they, would, they think they would be back to normal somewhere in 2023, 24. Good. Next slide. Business recovery, that's the steps taken to resume the business within an acceptable time frame following a disruption. So the timelines may range from, from minutes to weeks to months, and I'll show you from some of the, the, the testimonials I have of some companies that I pulled together that had their business continuity plan in place, depending on the recovery requirements. Good. Next slide. All right, some key terms here that you would that that help you to understand a business continuity would be what we call RPOs, RTOs, and TPDs. Good. So the RPOs is the point of time in which you would restore your data. So every business, I don't care if you have a one-person show business, every business uses data. Every business has an IT framework. Good. And as you know, when that is done, or <laughs> that's the end of that, you really can't do anything. So you need to have a system, an IT recovery system, that's able to let you know if you're capturing real-time data or you have, of course, a delayed backup. And then by the IT professional, he will be able or she will be able to tell you, okay, what would be the data loss? So they'll give you a time with the data when it may be lost and then when you will actually be recovering data. The recovery time objective is the period of time within which the operating system applications or functions must be recovered after an outage. So again, that could also focus on the whole IT system, but it also can focus on your processes, what processes you have in place, and when you expect to be back up with whatever processes you, you have in creation of your, of your business, um, be it product or services. MTPDs is the time it would take for adverse impacts, 
which might arise as a result of not providing a product or services or performing an activity becomes unacceptable. So obviously, some of you have been exposed to this pandemic, you know that you have a threshold. So even though you were doing pretty good, even though things have closed and you were, and you were dipping into your reserves, your reserves is not a bottomless pit. At some point, <laughs> the reserves are dry. So you, of course, it, it, when you have your BCP, you wouldn't wait till that point, but you wanna ensure that those things are clearly identified, that you know where the buck stops and where you need to activate your plan, you know? So we accept, before it reaches the unacceptable level, the expectation is that your plan will be in full focus by that time already. Next slide. All right, so what is the benefits of having some business continuity plans and business continuity system? Because the bigger picture is the system. Eh? The plan is just a part of it. So you would receive the passing grade from your international clients through second party audits. And even up to today, I, as I was in the vaccine, I was reading a magazine of one of my subscriptions that I have where International Risk Resilience Magazine, and they made a good point there. They were stating that some companies, when they do business with you, they actually send their, 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 um, their persons or their, their, what do you call them, their client, right? So the client will visit your facility and they want to see that you have some kind of business resilience BCP plan set up. It's, it's the in thing now, really, especially if you're going doing work with international clients who understand that perspective. They, want, they don't just want you on the phone to say, uh, you have a BCP? Uh, yeah, <laughs> you know, they want to see that you have that. Good. I actually, I, I, I felt proud when some of our, my, my, my uh, companies that I work with out of Point Leases, whereby one of my clients who worked for them called and said, hey, you know, they, they, they said they want to see my BCP. Could you do one for me? You know, so it, it has that, that, that is something that you must have. Again, reputation comes to play here. Your, 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 your ability to be, you know, they have the, the client don't want to make sure that when something hit the fan, you fall down flat because the, you remember your stuff affecting their business as well, all right? And it has the input, of course, the potential to save lives, which is so true, good? There's a life-saving uh, measure that you're taking because remember you're dealing with not only business disruption issues, but also um, socio-technical natural disaster issues as well. Uh, it ensures compliance with your legal, regulator, regulatory, and contractual requirements, something that we must observe. We have OSHTT here. They have certain requirements that we need to follow. Some of us deal with international requirements. And I know Ria could speak more to that when she reached in because that's her legal, you know, uh, finesse. She'll be able to put that in, in more perspective. All right. You look at their different things. You will have contractual requirements, just like I told you a while ago, your client coming to visit your site, performing a second party audit to ensure that you say you, you have what you say you have. Good. Um, it preserves your brand value and reputation. And I, and I always feel elated to see as, as companies in Trinidad, we are getting more and more, what is the word? And we're now getting, of course, a deeper understanding of what is reputation and what's it like to have a good business reputation. Who wants to do business with somebody who has a bad business <laughs> reputation? I mean, that's just straightforward. Good. Reputation brings sales. Good. I always remember when they had the, um, it was one of those drugstore companies when they had a particular incident and therefore they handle it so well that when, when the customer looks to buy their product and this is what reputation does for you. So if your product is $10 more all right, than the other product, because of your reputation, they'll buy it because it's $10 more. Yeah. So you have to know how reputation ties into the whole thing. It helps mitigate your financial risk. It protects your supply chain, which in this time is critical. And it gives you what you call that competitive advantage. All right, next slide. All right, so I had a few testimonials from, from a big list that I had to pull out of some companies that had their, their BCP come into play for certain events. So we have here um, Aenas Internet and Telephone um, Service Company in Tennessee. And in 2003, they had a experience a tornado. I'm just kind of summarizing due to time. And the internet, they lost more than $1 million in hardware and software. And the home office was completely destroyed because again, I remember you're talking about a, a, a naturally, how are you standing? You know, it come like a hurricane. You know, how do you deal with these things? And they had their BCP activated. And look at that, less than 72 hours later, they were back up fully serving, serving their clients. 
In fact, you know, many of their small clients didn't even know they had a disruption. You see, look at that big benefit that, that the BCP does to you. And that time frame is like what we call with the RTO, right? The recovery time objective. So within 72 hours, they were able to get back up and running and the disruption didn't even affect some of their clients. Next slide. You have Canty Technology in the UK, right? So they had a lightning strike uh, on their building in 2013 and it caused a fire to break out. And as part of their business continuity plan, Canty had already moved its, its client server to a remote data center where continual backup was stored. Even though Canty staff were forced to move to a temporary office, its clients never experienced an a, a interruption in service. So how good is that? They had that foresight, right? To create what we call a hot site, which I will explain to you in a little bit, to be able to continue business. Then you have, of course, um, in 2018, Samsam, they got an attack by a ransomware, which is very popular. And just for you to know, um, if you're following world news, you know the Northeastern states of America was crippled a, a couple of weeks ago by a, a cyber attack, a Russian cyber attack as well. Where, where, where that is concerned, causing a, a spike in a shortage in fuel being able to be delivered and a spike in the, in the gas prices. Good. And if you look at Forbes, Forbes stated by, by I think it's 2025, we would have had 2.1 trillion yeah, losses due to cyber attacks. So this is how, and remember we already said IT is critical, a critical backbone of your business. And that is something we really, really need to pay attention to. So the attackers, are only, they only demanded 52,000, lucky for them, but they st still stated the full impact of the attack was projected to be at 17 million. In the end, it cost them just 3 million for the system to be restored. Aspects of the BCP were implemented. So they had their BCP plan come to play. And just to let you know, your BCP plan, you may have slight impact, but the point about it, it could be a whole lot worse if you do not have your system in place, all right? So various business recovery strategies for some of those natural disasters and socio-technical disasters. Next slide. You can have some of these recovery options. You have things like what they call will transfer. You have a displacement of non-critical functions or people. Well, a lot of people kind of have that with the working from home. You have something called split sizing where you may have a particular operation and you would have another branch and you'll be able now to get one branch to let's say produce this particular product. And then you have another branch being able to produce that particular product. They kind of bring it into pieces, you know, it's broken up into pieces and they're able to bring it together operating on different sites. You have offshoring where you have that ability of um, working, whatever, depending on what the business is in, you may be able to have like an offshore office in it, and that will help great if you have like a major hurricane and, or a major earthquake where you are able to continue some business. You have a work area recovery, you have mutual aid, which is of course having certain agreements with other companies and many other BC strategies, which of course we will be talking about when you take part in our session on the 7th. All right, July 7th, next slide. So I love this, it, it, it's very short and sweet. So as we were looking at one of, I think was what, Canty or one of the, and then one of the others, where they spoke about the whole issue of, okay, so my head building is destroyed and therefore what are we staying home until we build back the business good how are we going to do it so one of the things that you have is some of these options here so you'll notice with cost strategy it's an expensive option you have to do your cost benefit analysis and see which would work for you but the hot side just means a mirror site so it's a site that replicates your present site which again has the as you see from the arrow below with time is the fastest method of getting your business back up and running. You have a relocation to other group. Luckily for you, if you're working in like how banks do, they have various branches and whatnot. That could work for them as a strategy. Remote working has its advantage, has its disadvantage, have its limited reach. Warm sites is a similar to a hot site, but you still have a lot of the hardware and software to add into the building. Good. You have um, reciprocal agreements where, where you might have agreements with other agencies. You have Mobile sites, again, depend on your business size, that might work for you. Coal sites is where you might just have a, you might just have a shed, right? I shouldn't just call it a shed, but a shell. You have a shell and you again move in all the necessary requirements. You have to deal with that, the hardware, the software, the people and everything. Um, rebuild and restore. 
And that's, of course, where, where some of the things happen. So, so the goal here is that you would have either a hot site, remote, warm site, reciprocal, as the list goes on and on. And then now that's where your insurance comes in to cover you to rebuild and restore right particular situation. But this is only dealing with the infrastructure. But we're going to hear from David and Rhea how that whole life life being lost well let's let's not forget about that lives being lost is also something critical what happens if the ceo of the business dies what next yeah what happens if a senior partner in the business die what next these are some things that even in, in the large scale of things a lot of people miss how then does the business go forward and this is where the insurance will come in to address that next slide all right, so guys, thanks again for, 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 for listening. I hope you got a nice little, you know, uh, teaser into what we're going to bring forward 7, 8, and 9th of July, dealing with business continuity. Good, we're going to hand over to, the, to our other speaker now. Hi. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for having me join today's session. Now, as my work is really designed to support a multi-generational continuity of family businesses, my presentation will focus, of course, on that broad continuity challenge that privately held enterprises and family-owned businesses face. So in today's session, just to give you an idea of what we will be touching on over the next few minutes, we'll start off with some common sayings and statistics on family businesses. Then we will consider something called a continuity planning vision board. And then finally, we will look at some strategies that you can use in building your own continuity plan. Next. Now, if you've ever attended a seminar on family business, I'm sure that you would have seen this before. From shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves in three generations, suggesting that the wealth that is created in the first generation is lost by the third. And that 30% of family businesses make it to the second generation, 12% to the third, and only about 3% to the fourth. Now, the statistics can, of course, be a bit off-putting, but I'm not here to go into the research or test the veracity of it. But certainly, if your business is heading into the second generation, at least for today's purposes, what did the 30% do in their continuity plan? And if your business is heading into the third generation, focus on what the 12% did. How did their continuity plan look? And of course, if your business is heading into the fourth generation, then I think you have truly beaten the odds. And please commission me to write a book about your family business. I would gladly do it. But family businesses face so many challenges along their legacy pathway. Challenges I'm sure that you yourselves can tell me about. But how do we convert those so-called problems into possibilities for growth, continuity, a next generation of great leaders and responsible owners of a business? So what did those families focus on? So I won't go into everything, but some highlights are that they focused on developing a continuity plan. They focused on developing good governance and next generation capacity, and they had a strong vision and value system. So now let's come back to us. What do you think of when you think of continuity planning? What comes to mind? It could be a definition, it could be words. Perhaps it's, it's in reference to what God was saying. Maybe you think of cybersecurity threats, um, changing in, in consumer behaviors, adapting to the new markets. You also have that side. You also have the wills and probate and maybe sibling rivalry, governance, leadership challenges. So you have all of that to consider. But the truth is continuity planning, especially in the Caribbean, tends to happen in a very ad hoc way with little to no formal planning. And the approach that is, tends to be adopted is a crisis-driven approach. So we wait for triggers like death and divorce and cybersecurity threats and pandemics, and then sometimes try to piece together a, a plan. But that's not what we want. If I ask you, what is your vision for the future of your business and for your family? Can you give me a well thought out vision and how exactly you are going to carry out doing this? So one of the things that I'd like you to consider is something called a continuity planning vision board. Next slide. And it really is a neat way when you are engaging in continuity planning to remind yourself of what are our objectives? What exactly are we trying to accomplish both as a family and as a business? Next slide. 
So of course, everyone's vision for their private enterprise or family business is going to be different. So this is a very general approach. Now, vision boards tend to be populated with pictures. So you can attach your own pictures to these words. But typically, the overriding objective or the vision generally to be achieved is really that we want to ensure there's a smooth transition of wealth, whether that wealth is our family assets or business assets. We want to ensure that there is harmony both in the family and in the business, that the risk of conflict is minimal. And we want to ensure that the assets actually survive the transition, that generational transition that is to happen. Now, of course, there are numerous ways that this can be accomplished and how one business achieves this is going to be different for another business but I'm gonna use this vision board to provide some strategies to achieving each of these elements. Next slide. So the first thing is that we want to ensure a smooth transition and I've divided our strategy into a structure and a skill. So the question here is, what are the best structures for me to have this smooth transition? Next slide. And there are so many tools that, that can help to facilitate this it could be a BCP, it could be a will, which is a very common planning, uh, estate planning tool. It could be a trust, maybe an offshore trust or one established right here in Trinidad, or perhaps we need a combination where a trust is set up in a will. What is the best type of planning vehicle that will suit your needs based on the vision that you have? Now also, as I'm speaking with business persons, the one thing that I will recommend is that when you are in fact setting up these structures, make sure that your probate will aligns with your corporate rule. So if you are, for instance, using a will, make sure the terms are consistent with any provisions of a buy-sell agreement or a shareholders agreement. And we will touch on that in a bit. And the skill that you'd need here, which I have always advocated for, is open and honest communication. And generally, you should have this if your transition is going to be smooth because this is where your intentions are made clear as to what you'd want. This is where you'd have views from the family on a continuity plan. And this is where persons become aware of why, for instance, particular bequests have been made, especially where there is room for perceived unfairness in a family. So later on, this helps to minimize the effects of any upheavals where persons may instead reach for notions of uh, unfairness and coercion. Next slide. Our next goal is harmony. And of course, we want to maintain family harmony and business harmony. But at the same time, we know that a business can, of course, become an arena to act out family conflicts. And that, sure, most families have rivalries. You have jealousies, you have injustices from long ago that may have absolutely nothing to do with the business. But sometimes those conflicts become focused in the business and they are acted out through the business. So for this slide, I actually chose the yin and yang symbol because it, it symbolizes how opposing forces may actually be complementary and how they interrelate to one another. Next slide. So it's the same thing here. Recognize that conflict is normal, disagreements are normal. It's part of our everyday relationships, whether it's a personal relationships, family or business. But how persons choose to deal with the conflict is really what sets them apart. And by the way, totally avoiding conflict at all costs is equally as devastating as all our warfare every day. So you must find that balance. You must actively manage that conflict. So for this strategy in structure, it would include having workable forms of governance. So for instance, we could leverage on governance structures such as an organized family meeting or something called a family assembly which is typically set up for families entering into the second generation where members are, are put in a, a safe and organized space to bring up um, issues and negotiate conflict. And then as part of that, we could also develop certain policies. And of course, this will help to clear up any ambiguities and help align any expectations with reality. So for instance, you can develop an ownership policy that outlines who exactly can be owners. Is it restricted to a bloodline or can spouses and partners also become owners? What are the roles and responsibilities of each of the owners, those that either work in the business and those that don't? And it's also beneficial to supplement this with the buy-sell or the shareholders agreement. You can also have a conflict resolution policy that outlines how as a family and business or a business only family, 
we will manage conflict, not if, but of course, when it arises. And one of the ways to do so, and it brings me to my skill, is by knowing when to bring in experts. So this could be a mediator. Some issues simply cannot be resolved internally and an objective expert trained to resolve com conflict could help cut through those emotions and focus on the issues. An expert could be an attorney or an insurance and financial advisor, a BCP planning expert. They help to clear up any misconceptions or really assist in overcoming challenges that you think there is no solution to. An expert could also be a psychologist or a counselor to treat with any delicate issues or mental health issues that a family member may be facing and which places concern in the entire family and business system. Next slide. And then finally, ensuring that the assets survive the transition. So if I can ask it this way, what are some of the ways in which family and business assets can be lost or dissipated? Well, as Garth mentioned, cyber attacks, floods, plant disruptions, fire, pandemics. Other reasons could be that there was no plan for an owner of a business and there may be disputes which causes the assets to be dissipated. And we see how sometimes that can play out in court. Divorce, a divorcing owner's interest may become the subject matter of a property settlement order. And what about retirement? Because yes, it can happen if there's no proper leadership transition that can affect the assets of the business as well as the business operations. Next slide. So for this, the structure that I would suggest is a buy-sell agreement. And you have heard me mention it in the two previous elements, transition and harmony. And it's also called a business prenup. And the buy-sell agreement is really a mechanism for an orderly business continuity in cases of certain triggering events. That could be, for instance, death, let's say death of the, the CEO, divorce, retirement, disability, bankruptcy, and so on. So it's such a versatile agreement that can, only, that can not only be used in the family business, but generally where there are two or more persons owning a business. So what it does, it affords the other co-owners that option or obligation to purchase the interest of an existing owner when the triggering event occurs. So it can be used, especially in a family business, to restrict outsiders or undesirable business partners from actually becoming owners. For instance, in the case of death of one of the co-owners, the company or the remaining shareholders can actually purchase the shares of the deceased owner. And that money could be used by the family of the deceased owner while ensuring that the interest of the remaining owners is not jeopardized by persons, by outside persons or by the family member of the deceased owner who really may not know anything about the business. So one of the funding mechanisms is of course, through the use of life insurance policies, which David may touch on. Another structure for this would be nuptial agreements or cohabitational agreements, which of course only relate to the breakdown of a marriage or of a common law relationship. So in addition to the business prenup, you can have your, your personal prenup or postnup. And regarding the skill. So quite often we focus on building our asset base, improving our lifestyle, sending our children to the best schools. We have grand ideas of legacy continuity. And that's great, because at the end of the day, the day, you want the assets that you have worked for, that you have put your blood, sweat, and tears in, that you maybe inherited from your family and you have grown into something substantial and profitable to be passed on to a next generation. But was it also part of your intention that that be squandered or they just don't know how to manage it or operate it or maybe even appreciate it? So I'm sure that it is not. You want the beneficiaries to grow it and to manage it prudently and perhaps pass it on to future generations or perhaps sell it as a profitable business because that too could be part of the vision. So the skill here is to prepare your beneficiaries for that inheritance. Prepare your beneficiaries for that continuity plan. Anyone could actually make a fortune, a fluke can turn into a fortune, but to actually preserve it and to grow it, it takes some doing. So do not underestimate the importance of education and professional development. It's, I think it's an absolute must in this landscape, but it does not stop there. 
you also want to set up guardrails of things like yes wealth and money management the importance of saving investing budgeting entrepreneurship but also things like conflict management communication skills self-awareness and even gratitude remember that you don't want to run the risk of them becoming only consumers of wealth you like them to become well creative in their own right too because it promotes responsibility and independence leading to a better equipped beneficiary leading to a better equipped future family business leader and owner that is now capable of stewarding a substantial legacy for that continuity of the business and of course much to the benefit of the family next slide so I know, of course, what was outlined here today was short, it was brief, but I do hope that uh, you would be able to carry with you some of the strategies from today's session and, of course, implement them in your own business. Um, I'm always interested to know from business owners, of course, you know, what are their challenges and, and what's, what is needed to truly support uh, the business community. Um, and I think we have David up next. Thank hi. you. Hi, hi. Thank you, Ria. And um, thank you, Gus. So this afternoon, I would like to look at the insurance side to the BCP. Um, next slide, right. So normally when we think about insurance, we think about, you know, the, 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 the ruin that comes to our personal property or commercial property, the fires, the floods, et cetera. But the death of a key person, the death of an owner of the business can have more of a disastrous effect than the loss caused by fire, theft, flood, or in some cases, tornado. Losses through errors of judgment of less competent replacements. Losses through evaporation of goodwill. And God spoke about reputation and how important reputation is, especially in today's businesses. Loss through companies' credit standing. So you as a key person in your business, you would have relationships. You would have relationships with your creditors. If you are no longer there, what is the standing of the business? Loss through competition that, could no, that can no longer be met. Losses in hiring and training a new person. So if you as a key person in the business, as the owner of the business, were to exit your business through death, or even becoming critically ill. Where would the business get the funds now to hire someone to replace you? And we as business people, we don't ever pay ourselves what we're worth. Losses through impaired morale of other workers. So you're the leader, you're the leader of your corporation, you're the leader of your company. Anything happening to you will have a, 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 an effect on your employees, on your staff. Next slide. So we as business people accept without question the wisdom of protecting the company against the loss of its property values. We take care to ensure the physical assets against losses from fire, windstorm, flood, et cetera. We take every precaution in ensuring capital assets against embezzlement and theft, yet protection against the loss of management assets of the business, the human resource of the business. Moreover, the fire, theft, or flood may never occur, but death comes to every person sooner or later. So I want us to consider that most of the time as business people, we protect the golden eggs, but we seldom protect the goose that is laying those golden eggs. So the business must determine who that key person is or who those key, key people are in the business. The profit making value of that key person will be lost at death. You know, a lot of the times, I've heard this, and they said that the cemetery is the richest place on the planet. Because all those opportunities and all those abilities in terms of making money will be lost if things are not put in place at the time of death. So the key person applies for insurance in the amount on the key person's life. The business owns and pays for the premiums of the policy and the business is the beneficiary of the policy. So what happens here is that if anything were to happen to the key person in the business, an insurance policy on the key person 
based on the financial value, the fin financial input of that person into the business is ascertained. The business owns and pays for the policy and the business receives a cash injection if anything were to happen to that key person. Next slide. So at the key person's death, the business gets cash. And we now ascertain from before this happens, what would that cash sustain? The cash would stabilize the business and keep it running. The cash will assure the creditors that all is well. The cash would assure customers that business will continue as normal. The cash will also retire pressing obligations, liabilities, et cetera, and give the business a good buffer. The cash will allow the business that nil disruption time to continue paying salaries, to hire and train a successor, to pay a temporary monthly income to the key person surviving spouse. That is very, very important because anything happened to you as a business owner, what happens to your family at that point in time? Your business normally takes care of you, takes care of your family. If you're not there to run your business, what happens to your family at that point? This is something that we have to consider. To be used in complex ways that may be advantageous and offsetting the loss of the key persons. So the cash comes into the business immediately when the business needs it. Free of income tax, practically the only way a business can be today can receive tax-free dollars is through this life insurance benefit. Next slide. In summarizing, if the key person dies prematurely, the plan guarantees that the cash will be available. The business credit will be maintained. Money will be there to hire and train a new person. Confidence is, is, is on the part of the customers, suppliers, and employees. If the key person lives to retirement, the plan guarantees that every going cash value will help tie the business over a stormy period. The policy will serve as collateral for confidential loans. So even if you're expanding your business and you have an equity investor coming into play, you now can have that equity investor, investor feeling very, very comfortable by knowing that if anything were to happen to you or anything were to happen to the key persons in the business, the business will, be, will receive some cash and their investment is secure. Yearly increases in cash values are not taxable. So the plan itself, if the, that key person does not die, allows for a cash asset for the business and continues to grow into retirement. Next slide. Now, the other aspect of the human resource I wanted to touch on is ensuring that your buy-sell agreement is in place. And as Ria mentioned before, putting these plans in place and not having the necessary funding for the plans is not really having a proper plan in place, right? Next slide. So I want you all to consider what are the problems surrounding the death of a shareholder, a family owned business, a privately owned business with partners. What, what is the effect on the heirs of the deceased? the surviving heirs of the deceased and the effect on the surviving shareholders, the surviving owners of the business. Next slide. So I wanna share a story with you all based on an existing client I have and some of the, the ruin and disruption that is in their business right now as a result of not having a proper buy-sell agreement in place. And when we're speaking about buy-sell agreement in this instance, I, as we have said before, it's a wide, wide, it, it encapsulates a wide um, variety of different options. But in this case, I want you all to consider the share interest and how is your shares as a business owner, what happens to your shares if one of the business owner dies? So in this instance, there are two brothers who owned a business and they grew the business to at least a hundred million dollar entity. After the passing of one of the brothers, the business was passed down to the two sons and the two sons control, con, con, control the 50% interest each in the business. Now the two sons here are now two cousins 
and they worked together. One of the, the cousins decided that this business is no longer for him. And the other cousin is very involved in the business, runs the business. The, the, the second owner, he, I mean, he, he plays golf, he's a rock star, he lines around the place, but he has 50% interest in the business, right? He has decided now that he wants to sell his shares and he wants to sell his shares to the competitor if it is the, the, the present owner, his business partner, cannot come up with the, the, the funds to pay him off. So we're looking at a $50 million investment in terms of buying out the shares of an existing member, right? Now, had the parents had certain things in place via a buy-sell agreement, something like this would never happen. So a liability-free company now has to look to the bank, to financial institutions, to borrow at least $50 million to buy out one of the other shareholders because an agreement wasn't in place. I want you all to consider that if you as a business owner, as a business partner, if anything were to happen to that business partner, your new business partner would be the next of kin of your business partner. So for example, if your business partner is married, your new business partner, should anything happen to that business partner, is now your, the, the wife. And we have to ask ourselves, does the wife know anything about the business? And what happens in that regard is that that particular business partner now has 100% of the work to do for 50% of the profits if he's not able at that point in time to have the funding to buy out the other business partner. Next slide. So the business partner now has to accept any associate who buys the, the, the C shares, even though the person is unwanted, unliked, or incap incapable. He has to haggle with an uncompromising lawyer or judge of a probate court as to the value of the deceased interest or sell out and lose what they have been building up for years. Next slide. So the advantages of having a buy-sell agreement funded is that it provides the money necessary to retire the shareholdings of a deceased associate immediately, exactly when the money is needed. It prevents a weakening of the business that would result from draining off cash or selling non-liquid assets. It eliminates the need for borrowing and being in debt for years. Consider how much the corporation would have to earn before taxes to pay off the principal and the interest on such a loan. Next slide. So the advantages in the agreement guarantees to the heirs, to the, to the surviving heirs of the shareholder that they will receive a fair price for the deceased shareholders, a price that was agreed to by the deceased himself before his death. It makes it necessary for the heirs to become participants in the business and dependent on the uncertainty of the divided in, on income. It wipes out the possibility of friction between the heirs and surviving business owners. It provides a guaranteed market for the deceased shares, which is the existing business owner at a stipulated price. Thus no one is going to drive a hard bargain with the heirs and the heirs are very well protected and taken care of. It prevents the heirs from suffering the embarrassment of pleading with the surviving associates for a little money to get along. So what this speaks to is that the surviving share, the surviving heirs will now have from the, from the business owner a buyout agreement that they now, their family now can, can carry along. Your business value is extremely important when establishing a buy-sell agreement. So the value should be reviewed every three to five years to ensure your family receives the correct amount for your interest in the business. In today's changing economy, it is important to review your current buy-sell agreement regularly to ensure it is aligned with the value of your business. Most businesses don't have enough excess cash in reserve to buy out a shareholder's spouse upon and an unfortunate demise. The life insurance is earmarked to pay a buyout a deceased business owner's interest with the funds going to the family. 
purchasing life insurance can be a relatively inexpensive way to fund your buy-sell agreement, knowing that the funds are available when the circumstances arise and reduce the anxiety of about, about a family's livelihood and guarantees the proper payout for a spouse. Next slide. So we must consider what is our exit strategy in our business. And our exit strategy can be either voluntarily or involuntarily. Voluntarily is that strategy we will plan for retirement and how do we pass on the reins to our successors? Where do we get the funding to ensure that we are taken care of at retirement and that our business continues to run and passed on to our successors and our heirs? We can exit our business involuntarily as well through death, critical illness, and any type of sickness which would put us down for a couple of years as well. So this could mean the difference between ownership transition becoming a capstone of your success or being a, a, a slippery slope to financial demise. So the idea here is to plan your exit, exit strategy and ensure that the agreements are properly funded and mitigated by insurance. Next slide. So that's it for me, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. Over to you tomorrow. All right, thank you so much. Thank you to our panelists. We now have our Q&A segment. Please submit your questions via the Q&A chat box below. Okay, I'm seeing a question here. Uh, it us is this applicable to professional partnerships example attorneys within a private practice or doctors that work together so perhaps i can answer that one um yes especially where uh, your vision is for instance if you have a partnership um you have a partnership agreement that outlines any exit strategies and so on uh, but your vision may be, look, you know what, I want to pass this business on to my kids. So part of your strategy would be, I'm going to buy out the shares, I'm going to buy out my, my, my partner's interest and convert this into a limited liability company. So that way I can have shares to transfer to, to uh, my children or other beneficiaries. So definitely it can be applicable to a partnership. All right, thank you, Ria. Uh, Mr. Vincent, there's a question for you. Given that you provided international examples of BCP's benefiting organizations, do you have any local examples that you can share? To be honest, local, local data in terms of putting um, their information forward for others to learn from, because again, the, the whole purpose of the examples that we have, there's information that you can learn from. I think as a society, we have not really matured yet in relation to that. There are some little small isolated um, things. For example, most of the energy companies, they would have some level of strategy in place for BCP and established BCP plans. And they dealt pretty well with regards to the, like the flash flooding incidents, and then, of course, the even with the present pandemic situation. So there are some of them, but we I don't think we really have um, matured as a society yet in, in, in showing the value of our experiences and sharing it with others. Yeah. If, if, um, if I can um, jump in here for one one quick question to Garth, actually, um, in terms of having the BCP, um, oh, it, you have the provisions in the BCP, but to actually go through, let's say, the pandemic or the fire in real time, can it then highlight maybe certain gaps in the BCP to be worked on and improved? Well, yes, definitely. So um, the BCP, as I said, it's part of a larger system, which is the Business Continuity Management System, ISO 22301. And one of the, the model frameworks that we work with uh, that is what you call the PDCA model, which is the Plan, Do, Check, Act model. So it's an iterative system, which means that there's always a view of continual improvement taking place. You're always looking at ways in which to get that, that, um, that, that handled or executed. And I, I, and I know a couple of persons, the pandemic has 
proven for them to go along and tweak their plan as they as they go along. So the continual improvement part of it is is a big phase in the whole business continuity continuity management system. Hope I answered your question. Yes, thank you. Thank you for those questions. Okay, so the last note we had in the chat box was uh, for a bit more information on the BCP training that got uh, mentioned earlier, but I can just respond to that. So yes, we do have an upcoming business continuity planning workshop taking place on the 7th, 8th and 9th of July. Uh, in that session, in those sessions, what you'll learn is how to create risk assessments. So how do you conduct these assessments? How do you uh, how do you conduct the business impact analysis? How do you create recovery strategies? And of course, ultimately craft your business continuity plan. So if you have any more questions on that, if you'd like further info, I, I'm happy to share the course out. I have it. So if you need to email me, take the email address there, open enrollment at lockjackjsp.edu.tt. So finally, I'd just like to thank everyone for being here. Thank you for taking the time out of your schedules to join us for this webinar. I trust that it was insightful, thought-provoking, and that you gained some value from it. Thank you to our panelists, Mr. Vincent, Mrs. Manki Sukram, and Mr. Blanc, for sharing your time and expertise with us today. If you guys would like to contact them, feel free to reach out via email. Um, so their emails are up on the screen right now. Feel free to reach out. I'm sure they'll be happy to hear from you. And enjoy the rest of your Friday. Have a safe and enjoyable weekend, everyone. Take care.